What happened at the dawn of our cosmos is the missing piece needed to understand how the universe came to be. A new experiment has failed to confirm the observations of the so-called cosmic dawn. It's been disconfirmed, and often we think that failure is making a blunder. Let's examine what that means. Cosmologists upended our view of how the universe formed structures billions of years ago. Wait, I thought that was a Bicep 2 experiment, right? In fact, didn't some guy named Keating write a book about that whole affair called losing the Nobel Prize? No, the Bicep 2 affair was in 2014. This new result came from the EDGES experiment in 2018, four years later. What is Cosmic Dawn anyway? Well, I study the cosmic microwave background, the leftover heat from the formation of the lightest elements on the periodic table. When hydrogen formed 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was a relatively quiet place for perhaps millions of years. The hydrogen atoms that first formed, once they cooled down, they were able to absorb and then emit what's called 21 centimeter radiation. It's one of the most important types of atomic transitions known in all of physics. These atoms of hydrogen can emit and absorb 21 centimeter radiation at equal rates which made the earliest clouds in the universe that filled our cosmos effectively invisible. But then came the cosmic dawn, when the first stars ignited, releasing high energy ultraviolet radiation. That radiation can cause the hydrogen atoms to transition, making more absorption of 21 centimeter wavelength radiation than they emitted. When astronomers look back to these early clouds of hydrogen, they would see excess absorption and that would appear as a drop in the brightness due to the absorption at a specific, highly accurately known radio wavelength. And that would mark the time when these first stars turned on and ignited the universe. That's called cosmic dawn, sort of the ignition that caused the universe to start glowing. Eventually, those early stars, called population three, would collapse into black holes. The hot gas around these black holes could generate x-rays that heat up the hydrogen clouds and cause the increasing rate of hydrogen emission to increase even further. We'd observe this excess emission as an uptick, an increase in brightness at slightly shorter wavelengths. The net result would be a dip in brightness over a very narrow radio wavelength range. The exact wavelength of emission and absorption would be determined by the redshift of these hydrogen clouds. This is what was claimed by the EDGES experiment back in 2018. The redshift goes from 21 centimeters to 400 centimeters, or namely about four meters. So these are very long length radio waves, much, much longer than the two millimeter wavelength of CMB photons. And this is what cosmologists had expected. But initial alarm bells were rung when they saw the shape and the trough of these different absorption features were not as expected. The dip was extremely deep, and that was troubling for many astronomers because it suggested that the hydrogen was much colder than what theoretical models predicted. So it fell on theoretical astronomers to come up with conjectures as to why the universe would have even colder hydrogen than expected. Maybe there was some sort of strange interaction between the hydrogen and dark matter that must have filled the cosmos back then because it fills the cosmos today. Or maybe the EDGES experiment has something to do with the instrument itself. Hydrogen's 21 centimeter emissions eventually reach Earth with these long wavelengths due to the redshift between the emission and the absorption or detection of these primordial radio wavelengths. Now, this wavelength regime falls in the same band that we use for radio transmission and television broadcast. That's why edges had to be so far away, so remote in Australia. Even more pronounced is the emission from our galaxy, not the dust emission that plagued the BICEP2 experiments results, but actually emission of what's called synchrotron radiation in our galaxy. And there's even effects from the atmosphere that these uh, radio astronomers had to contend with. It was an exquisite measurement. These astronomers were well aware that the instrument can produce at least as large a signal as they predicted. The question is, why did it slightly change in the area of this trough to make it much more pronounced? Why would it affect only this trough that was measured? So it fell upon another group of astronomers to confirm or refute these claims. And as you can guess, they didn't find confirmation. Contending with all these sources of contamination, so-called systematic contamination, be it from the cosmos, but not truly cosmological, it could be from our galaxy, it could be from the sun, it could be from some local source here on Earth, or it could even be from man-made or terrestrial interference. 
the Edges team look for these patterns and they were excruciatingly, exquisitely painstaking in their search for other explanations besides claiming a detection of this primordial signal, which was truly groundbreaking at the time. Perhaps it had something to do with the effects of the edges of these giant metal screens that were placed in the ground that blocked the antenna from seeing terrestrial emissions from the ground. The Edges team modeled all the different types of interactions, and they found still the signal persisted. They knew for certain that this type of effect from the instrument could mimic exactly the signal that they saw, so they want to be exquisitely precise. Now, a competing team trying to reproduce the results or disconfirm the results, called SARAS, took a completely different experimental antenna approach. They took an entirely different design philosophy in order to preserve the smoothness across as many wavelength features as possible. Their antenna for SARAS was an aluminum cone propped up on a styrofoam raft floated in the middle of a placid lake. And that ensured there'd be no reflections for more than 100 meters in any direction. It's a cool type of approach. It's a passive way of shielding your instrument rather than having some active or baffling use the earth and this lake to act as a shield against terrestrial emissions. What's more ingenious is that the slow speed of light or radio waves in water reduces the effect of reflections from the bottom of the lake. And the uniform density of water made the environment easier for these scientists to predict and remove potential sources of contamination. When the SARS team tried and then failed to re reproduce the edge's result, they saw no sign of the deep dip at this four meter wavelength, which had been claimed. Now, technically, the SARS team ruled out the specific dip at this precise four meter wavelength, but they didn't rule out dips at other wavelengths. That's gonna be for other teams, and perhaps even including the SARS team, to follow up on. So what to make of these results? Where do we go to improve upon them? Well, Cynthia Chang, who's a radio astronomer at McGill University in Montreal, Cynthia says that these two teams were exquisitely thorough in both calibrating, which is a process that experimentalists use to remove sources of systematic error, and how they analyze the data. And that she's not comfortable yet saying which is right and which is wrong. So she says the level of disagreement is enough to make people uncomfortable. From her perspective, she says it adds to the excitement, a drama, in fact. And luckily, she's actually leading another follow-up experiment that's called PRISM that will operate on a small island a thousand kilometers off the coast of South Africa, where terrestrial radio telescopes seek so much interference from. And that was the main challenge for SARS and for the EDGES experiment. But for PRISM, she claims it'll almost be totally absent. Other experimentalists, such as my friend Aaron Parsons at UC Berkeley, who's an expert in this field, he actually claims he thinks the SARS null result, the disconfirmation, will hold up. That we haven't measured the cosmic dawn signal. It's simply, perhaps, too painstakingly small for our experiments to ever detect. But a key point, which holds true not only for edges, but also for bicep, is that it stimulated growth and innovation and attention to this important field, moving it forward, he says. This brings us to a big problem, though, in science, from my perspective. Often, a result from experimentalists, such as myself or my colleagues, makes a front page headline, a big splash, even appearing on TV and sources like CNN and elsewhere, and instantly there's calls for attention and follow-up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when there is a retraction, often it doesn't come for months. And when it does come, it's not on page one above the fold, it might be on page B17 of the Saturday edition, which is the least read of all newspaper editions. So the public is often left with the impression that the original result holds true. I've even heard from fellow physicists that when finding out that I was involved with BICEP, say, oh, I heard that you guys won the Nobel Prize. Well, of course, spoiler alert, my book is called Losing the Nobel Prize. Not only did I lose it, but nobody has won it for the detection of primordial gravitational waves from the postulated epoch of inflation. So what do you think? Should physicists be a little bit more cautious in how they communicate? Should they not even have press releases, press conferences all together? Let me know in the comments. And click here to find a very special playlist that I made describing other exquisitely sensitive, ingenious experiments seeking to determine the nature of reality in our cosmos.